Hey there, welcome to the Game Artist Podcast. My name is Ryan Kingsline. I am the founder of the Game Art Institute, where we train artists for the career of their lives. In this podcast, we interview amazing game artists to see what makes them tick and see how they got where they are today. So sit back, relax. I look forward to sharing their journey with you. All right, so here you guys are seeing James and uh, his art station. He's also got a gum road and uh, has done some really cool stuff inside of Substance. And so what I really wanted to do is just get him in and start to talk a little bit about what he's doing right now um, in his job, his journey to get that job, and then also um, see if we can't kind of pick his brain in Substance because that's kind of one of the that's one of the big deals for us today, right? Um, so for everybody who's here live, who's actually in the webinar with me, guys, uh, feel free, shout your questions out as, as you come, but I will also have a time and uh, place in which we will ask those questions. Uh, so have your questions at the ready. If you're over here on uh, live, make sure you uh, pop a note in there and make sure you tell me that you can hear me and everything's good uh, there. So I know that that's all working. So I'm looking at uh, a couple of different screens here, depending on uh, what we're doing. So, James, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. All yeah. Right. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm James. Um, right now, I'm a uh, hard surface artist at uh, Avalanche Studios. Um, so, I guess that's kind of my introduction. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, tell me something about Avalanche yeah. Studios. Like, what kind of projects do you guys work on? Um, let's see. In the past, we've made um, Just Cause, Mad Max, mm -hmm. uh, Renegade Ops. Mm -hmm. um, that's Pretty much uh, most of the games, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So how long have you been working there? Uh, let's see. I've been with Avalanche for, I think it's going on like six months almost now. Great. Um, so, before then, yeah. I was at um, Algorithmic and then just a couple of indie studios. Right. But, yeah. All right. So tell me, um, what have you done to prepare yourself for this job? Because I was really fascinated. Mm -hmm. um, to I, I really just wanted to talk to you at this stage because... Um, you're in the very beginning of your career, right? Correct. Yep. Um, but you've been able to kind of get some recognition through your gum road and through mm -hmm. um, sharing your knowledge. Yeah, totally. That's great. Yes. So mm -hmm. tell me, um, how, what did you do for school? How did you educate yourself for this? Yeah. So um, basically, um, as far as schooling goes, um, I pretty much just learned online. Yep. Um, I didn't go to college. Um, I was supposed to go to um, the Noman School of Visual Effects mm -hmm. um, over this fall, but um, turned out that Avalanche gave me an offer, so um, nice. I just took them up on that. But um, yeah, I mean, I just pretty much started learning from um, just on YouTube, some of yeah. the free tutorials, and then um, I got myself a digital tutor's subscription, which <laughs> um, I just got with some uh, scraped up money from um, working at Best Buy mm -hmm. and... Uh, then um, digital tutors went away, so they changed to a plural site creative, which um, I kind of miss the old digital tutors, <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, I just decided to start going with uh, places like the Noman Workshop and uh, Gumroad just for some more, like, I guess, uh, specialized, more advanced um, tutorials, I guess. So cool. that's well, pretty much um, how I learned. Yeah. A fun little fact. I don't know if you guys know this, but Paul Gabry actually used to work there at Best Buy too, right before he joined Pixelogic. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's Best, funny. Best yeah. Buy's been doing good for us. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, really. <laughs> All right. Okay. So self-taught, um, mm -hmm. got a job before you even plunked down $100,000 on training. At and, least. Yeah. yeah at least. <laughs> You know, not yeah. to mention the cost of living, especially in Los oh, Angeles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. And yeah, then there's the opportunity yeah. <laughs> cost, uh, as they say, when mm -hmm. they calculate these things. So, yep. Yeah. So, what, what, got, what got you noticed? Do you know? Like, mm -hmm. what, what uh, um, did I, they see that they mm -hmm. loved? Yeah, um, I think mostly it was just um, some of my work with uh, materials, mm -hmm. um, specifically doing like, um, just these kind of weird kind of shaders in um, Substance Designer, kind of like um, this tempered metal material was um, something that a lot of people liked when I was first kind of starting yeah. off. Because um, it just has some of these more complex blends, which 
at the time, it was um, kind of hard to come across some of these materials without going through like a major texture source. Um, mm-hmm. So it was just kind of, um, I think it was different for people being able to access like a more indie sort of texture shop. And so it kind of dragged a lot of attention towards my portfolio. Um, just having all these different, I guess, materials. Right. Just a little bit more complex type shaders. And I know yeah. for sure that this shingle study mm-hmm. definitely helped because I just released like a free tutorial on Gumroad a few months back. And I want to say it probably got me like maybe three recruiters contacted me no from way. like three separate studios. Yeah. And I gained like probably 500 followers on ArtStation just from this. So that was kind of like my foot in, sort of. Mm -hmm. But of course, I think the major factor to how I was able to get in was just kind of by picking other people's brains from around the industry. So like Sebastian Degay, he's the uh, founder of Algorithmic. Mm -hmm. I met him back at SIGGRAPH 2016. And I was able to kind of like talk to him and be like, hey, I love Substance. If there's any like opportunities that you think like would be open in the future, I'd love to take part in it, maybe an internship or something. Mm-hmm. So I ended up contacting him a few months later just to do an internship at Algorithmic. And it went through just because he realized how much of a passion I had for creating materials. And basically from there, since Substance is kind of like a uh, hot new topic now, which kind of all the studios want to grab people that know Substance. Mm-hmm. Having algorithmic on a resume was basically like just having pure gold. It was just, (laughs) (laughs) it it just kind of sealed the deal. So I guess what I'm trying to say is portfolio always comes first, but also if you're able to meet people within the industry, that's definitely a plus. Yeah, that's Um, great. Yeah. And do you know Wes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was actually, when I was interning there, he was basically like, I guess you could say the lead of the office that I was at. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. He's hopefully going to come in and do some classes, actually. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, I love one. Uh, show me that breakdown, if you don't mind. Let me see the Substance yeah, totally. Designer breakdown and give people a sense of like, mm-hmm. what's, what is something that gets you 500 mm-hmm. followers on ArtStation mm-hmm. and, um, and three recruiting mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Offers. So um, basically, I think the first thing you have to do is just develop a solid uh, material, like a solid base material. Mm-hmm. So that's what I made with these shingles is just like probably spent maybe six or eight hours on them, just getting it kind of more finely tuned. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't think it's quite up to the quality that I'd like it to be. But back then, I was pretty happy with it. So um, it got a decent amount of attention. And uh, I just decided to release a tutorial just why not? So I basically posted up this breakdown shot. I linked it to uh, my gum road, which at the time was like stagnant. And I just made it free. So everyone loves free <laughs> education. Mm-hmm. So 80 level, the, I guess, uh, game news yep. kind of publisher, like the major game news publisher, I guess. They picked it up and they were like, oh, hey, James has a free tutorial that he just made. It's available for free. And that's what really got a lot of people kind of wanting to uh, download this, I guess, tutorial, just because it got a ton of views on 80 level. So I guess my advice would be, if you have something that you think is, you know, a pretty good quality, if you just make a tutorial that's free, it will get you tons of views. And also the great thing about these free tutorials is that you're also kind of helping out the community. Because there's a lot of other like paid tutorials or breakdowns, which sometimes might not even reach the quality of your free tutorial. Mm-hmm. So it's a win-win for both you and the person who gets the material. And uh, also, I just kind of made like a quick video for on YouTube for it, which I don't know. I guess it got, I think, like 800 views, which also dragged in more attention to the portfolio. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that's it's kind of a uh, chance of luck, mostly, I would say. Okay. Yeah. So where's the mm-hmm. breakdown? How are you doing a breakdown? Yeah. Let's see. So the breakdown is just on my Gumroad. Okay. So, if so you we go head here, over to your, you put it on ArtStation, and mm-hmm. then that's just a link over to the Gumroad. Exactly, yeah. And I put it to my homepage so that people can see all my work. Mm-hmm. They don't just get locked to seeing one single product. Okay. It's basically like the idea of 
if you run a store, why would you want to link someone to one specific product versus mm -hmm. them seeing your entire catalog? So let's see. So the way that I handled this is that you can basically just click, I want this, and you can download it. And what it is, is it's just basically a, um, let's see. Okay, that's going to take forever. Um, it's just a video of me going over how I strung together this material. Mm -hmm. um, it's nothing too it? special. I think it's like exactly an hour long. That was kind of the target that I was trying to hit, just kind of taking like a quick glance over the full material, mm -hmm. just to give people an idea of what nodes I use and my general thought process for when I'm creating materials. And basically, there's also like a paid tier to which you can get the actual substance file. Nice. Um, which nice. Is, yeah, okay. it's, yeah, it's just like a little added bonus kind of. So that's basically the way that I go about, I guess, <laughs> marketing free tutorials. Even yeah, it's and, like, but that's what I, yeah. I love. And that was one <laughs> of the things that was really important for me to talk mm -hmm. to you about is because, you know, it's... Mm -hmm. I mean, this industry is, it's a meritocracy, but part of that yeah. is just getting people to even notice you. And, right. you know, my mm -hmm. entire career, everything was built on tutorials and giving away knowledge and being there, you know, mm -hmm. for, the, for the important software. And so, right. you know, I can see you're doing these exact same steps of making this available mm -hmm. only with the platforms that are available today. So this is really neat. And this is also mm -hmm. a model, I think, that the boot campers can all kind of approach as mm -hmm. well. Oh, so yeah. When, when we're talking about this, substance designer is one of these things that's really dragging a lot of attention. So if you don't mind, I want to talk mm -hmm. just a little bit about yeah. you know, what substance designer mm -hmm. is to you and how it fits into your pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to me, substance designer, I started using it after I used Substance Painter because right. it's a little bit of a, um, it's an intimidating program to say the least, just yeah, with it yeah, having a least. complete node structure. <laughs> yeah, it just it. looks really unfamiliar to... Um, like artists for the most part, just because we're not used to seeing like a node workflow. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, <laughs> two reasons I was using Substance Designer were for one, Substance Designer is a highly desired skill in a very, very small, I guess you could say market. There's not many people who know how to use Substance Designer. Yeah. Especially that know how to use it well. So I basically figured is I might as well just specialize doing that. And then also another reason, this was probably the major reason I didn't use another program mm -hmm. was because um, <laughs> at the time I could just not afford ZBrush and I wanted to create these tileable textures. You, you and know what I love about this? I, 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 love, yeah. I love that like not too long ago you couldn't afford ZBrush mm -hmm. and now yeah. <laughs> you just focused on substance and now you have a job. Yeah. Where yeah. presumably you yeah, can afford no, ZBrush today, you know. I mean, it's not cheap, but Yeah, yeah, I just recently bought it and um I love the program. It's fantastic. So awesome. Um yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if I would have gone as deep as I did into Substance Designer had I got ZBrush earlier because yeah. I mean, there's just some stuff in ZBrush that's like just stupid easy to do compared to Substance Designer. But um anyways, yeah, so Substance Designer <laughs> part of the reason why I started using it cuz I just I was afraid of ZBrush, which is a really bad thing. I wouldn't recommend not using a program because you're afraid of it. And also just because money-wise, it was just way cheaper. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of how I started using Substance Designer. The way that it fits into my pipeline today, though, um, well, is that I uh, usually... Let me, let me stop yeah. you right there. So like, how, how would you sure. describe Substance Designer? And specifically, mm -hmm. what I mean is in the context of Substance Painter, because we all start with Painter because it's, you know, it's fun. Um, yeah, so yeah, totally. Why would I go into Substance Designer? What does it do that is useful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically Substance Designer compared to Painter, you can really use both of them for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But I think if you want to have more control over your substance, you should probably use Substance Designer. Substance Painter, I would use if you're not looking for too much control and you're looking to just kind of texture um, assets. Designer is a little bit more of an environment artist tool, I would think. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot more like driving a manual car yeah. versus driving an automatic. If you think of Substance Painter as your automatic car, it can, for the most part, do what you want it to, but there's just some little things that it can't quite do. 
And also, it's just very rewarding once you learn to use Substance Designer, much like a manual car. It's just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can really use them for a lot of the same things, but for creating environments, I would recommend Designer. Texturing assets, especially hard surface assets, I'd recommend Painter. Uh, But they're both great. Great. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you have either one of those on this computer that we can actually start to... Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, uh, so... Dive into um, something, because what... I know mm-hmm. in Substance, I was talking to Wes, and, and I understand mm-hmm. Substance Painter in the sense of, you know, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's basically Photoshop with procedural mm-hmm. masks and such. Uh, exactly. So, so really mm-hmm. what it's doing is it's allowing you to procedurally generate material over procedurally separated mm-hmm. areas of a model and then yep. go in and touch it by hand. Correct. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. You know, I get that because it looks like Photoshop. Mm-hmm. And then boom, you go into mm-hmm. Substance Designer and you're like, that doesn't look like Photoshop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it looks completely alien. Yeah, with Substance Designer, it's for anyone who hasn't seen it, I'll just open it up really quick. Um, yeah, so basically, this is Substance Designer. It is basically you start off like this, which Compared to a substance painter over here, mm-hmm. it just looks like night and day, really. Yep. So this, I like to think of substance designer more as a tech art tool. You're kind of having to find and mash together a lot of things. So like, if I wanted to create like maybe a ground material, what I'd do is I'd take noise. Substance designer is completely based around noise and shapes, mm-hmm. just combining them. So like, it's a lot like the UE4 material editor. You just kind of take these shapes and mash them together to start getting results that you're looking for. That's an interesting Um, uh, phrase, actually. That that I mm -hmm. I talk to the bootcamp people a lot about this idea of finding the vocabulary, and you just Mm -hmm. said that substance designer is it's noise and shapes. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's yeah. That's usually how I like to think of it when I break it down. It's just noise and shapes, and you have to manipulate those shapes to create things and then use different um, types of noise or fractals mm-hmm. or you know procedurals right to, to distribute it correct yep yep exactly yeah and i really like it because it's almost random in a sense so you don't always know what you're going to get exactly mm-hmm. with what you're creating mm-hmm. but the end result you can always pretty much always 100 percent obtain the look that you're going for initially um, which that's a really interesting concept to me, just being able to take all these random shapes and basically create exactly what you were looking for. And um, then so just, like, a, just like a silly question, yeah. is, is this 3D space that these things exist in, 2D mm-hmm. UV space? Can you swap them mm-hmm. around? Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. So they are just 2D images basically applied to a 3D mesh. All it is is textures. So it goes through the um, UVs. Correct, yes. Great. I would think so. Yeah, I'd, you might have to ask Wes just to be 100% sure, but I yep. think that's the gist of it. Okay. Yeah, and just there's like all these really kind of neat things that you can do inside of here. Like if I'm trying to create just like a really super quick, dirty um, ground texture, mm-hmm. this will be done in like 15 seconds. No albedo, but let's see. That's great. We had actually Josh Parker in and. To, and he did a quick little mm-hmm. uh, ground too, so this would be really neat to see. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally cool. Yeah, it's um, oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a super powerful program, especially once you start utilizing like uh, the uh, tessellation features. Tessellation just makes everything look amazing. Can you explain the tessellation? And, uh, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. So tessellation is basically when you take a mesh, you can subdivide it like x number of times just mm-hmm. to get a higher resolution. And then you can increase the scale of the mesh to basically carry this height that you're seeing. Uh, Let me expand this window just to make it a little bit easier. So this height here that you're seeing, I can change it Mm -hmm. based on scale. That's independent of normal values. So this is with just a normal map. This is with your tessellation and scale enabled. And so with this, you can just get better shading. And you can just kind of exaggerate more materials. Um, and, and how does tessellation affect this? So if you start mm-hmm. to lower your tessellation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if I lower the tessellation, it will, uh, let's see. It's basically just going to make the, um, I have to find my editor here. Uh, there we go. 
it will basically just make the texture have less resolution. So you can see here, the higher the tessellation amount, the higher resolution. And then the scale is just simply making the dirt protrude more out of the surface. Um, yeah, and when you, in, when you uh, combine this with an ambient occlusion map, yep. you can get some super, super cool results. I'll do that real quick. Let's see. Refresh. And let me just surround here. Great depth. So you're seeing we're instantly just getting some better shading here. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, so now this is super, super rough. Created again in like not that much time at all. Yeah. So if you have more time and you can really like kind of noodle with this, mm -hmm. you can get some super, super cool results. I don't think I render any of my materials without tessellation and ambient occlusion mm -hmm. just because it really helps define your surface. So if you're going to be rendering out like images for portfolio or anything, I would really recommend using ambient occlusion and tessellation for your mesh. Yeah, but Great. I would not say use it at real time inside of a game because some engines just cannot handle that yet. So, And so how do you create those cylinder images? Are you doing that entirely mm -hmm. inside a designer where you create like mm -hmm. an, an example of, of what the shingles are going to look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So basically for the shingles, it's again just patterns and noises. Mm -hmm. So I'll just get rid of this 3D view for a second since we won't need it quite yet. So for like the shingle, uh, what I did was... There is a special shape, which is somewhere here. Here we go, gradient linear two. So you start off with this curve here. Yeah. And I'm just going to start doing some uh, transformations to it to get it to the correct shape that I want. Uh, let's see, tile mode, salute, no tiling. Snap. Scale it down. OK, so basically, this is like our base shingle. Yeah. Oh, did I lose you? As we're waiting for uh, James to come back on, this is one thing I want you guys to really just keep in mind. What, you know, and I want to know what you guys really picked up from watching this, but what does this industry really need? Think about how you can provide what this industry needs. Because I know as artists, we tend to think about what we can provide. And you, we just got to start to think about what does the industry really need? What is it looking for? Uh, Corinne, there is procedurals on characters all the time. I mean, in, in fact, it, uh, leather, in many ways, there's awesome leather that is procedural that goes onto a character. Skin, skin is procedural. I mean, it's almost as procedural as it gets. You just have to have the proper kind of pattern, so to speak. But yeah, lots of procedurals on characters. All right. Just waiting for your audio, James. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure where I left off. Right when we only had one tile. Oh, okay, cool. So I'm um, guessing probably right here. Yep. Yeah, cool. So um, basically, the only thing that you would really do to this shape is, I'm not sure if I explained this part, but what I did was I just took our base shape, mm -hmm. which had this hole cut out in it, passed it into a blend, and uh, I multiplied this gradient on it. So what this is basically, or sorry, I subtracted this gradient. Mm -hmm. um, what this is saying is that areas that are white will be a low spot on this um, okay. as far as height value. Yeah. And dark areas will be a light spot. So it's basically just creating a ramp going from here to here, increasing okay. in height. Yeah. And then it's just put into a blur. This will basically just give it a less sharp edge, and it'll look more like a uh, kind of like a thick roof tile. Mm -hmm. The next thing I did was just plug it into a uh, tile sampler. And um, I just changed the pattern to pattern input, and I just changed the uh, scaling amount in X and Y. So this is a really, really cool thing I love about Substance Designer. It's that you can basically manipulate all these shapes so that, say that for some reason, a um, game designer needs a material 
to have like 30 shingles instead of 16. Mm -hmm. You can easily just change the X and Y amount without having to um, actually, I guess, uh, scale your UVs to that material, if that makes sense. Okay. So you don't have to tile the texture. You can just create the X and Y amount inside uh, Substance Designer. So it's super, super easy to just go back and make quick changes this way. Mm -hmm. And then also, all at one time, we can change every single parameter for these shingles. So we can make them more tightly spaced. We can change the position on them if we want a slight offset. Let's see, we need it really, really low. 0, 0, 0.05. Yeah, I guess it's slightly offset. And uh, let's see. We can also change the offset here a little bit. And let's see. We can also do stuff like rotation random, which will just make the tiles kind of just turn on each other. Mm -hmm. Um, which sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get them to blend correctly. You can see that they're cutting through each other. Mm -hmm. But um, if I think there's a uh, parameter in here, if we change the... Um, to take the highest the value. Blending mode. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if we were to clamp it, I believe it would probably tile a little bit better. Okay, so I guess we can even just adjust it through here. Um, just with our subtract value inside blend. <laughs> and this is uh, something that's also kind of good to mention. Inside of Substance Designer, there's like a thousand ways to do one thing. Mm -hmm. There's not one specific way of doing something, but there's only probably five ways that are correct to do it. Yeah. Just to yield good results for the end product. So this right here is like really quick and kind of sloppy. So we're getting some kind of edge artifacts. Who knows if anyone would actually notice it once it's in a material, but if you really want to make a more polished material, I probably would have spent a little bit more time just on this base shape here. But just for demonstration purposes, I think it works. So then after you create like your base material here, let's see, you just basically start layering on like noises. So let's see, find some noises. And uh, basically, what we're doing here, just adding in some little imperfections to the surface, mm -hmm. just so that it looks a little bit more realistic at runtime. So um, basically, a really good tip that I learned, um, it doesn't really follow um, kind of like, I guess you could say, core artistic guidelines, I guess. Um, it's more of a hack. But... The more that you start layering in detail, the better most people will think it looks. That was said by, uh, who was it? I think Mateus at Machine Games. He's a junior artist at Machine Games. He's super talented. Mm -hmm. So the way that I like to think of it, which is probably maybe a little bit better of a way to think of it, is that the more detail or the more variation you add to a material, the more realistic it will look. So I like to create a lot of little tiny imperfections, a lot of grunge, a lot of color distortion, because it really adds to the overall look of the material mm -hmm. so that it looks how a material would look in real life. So for example, since I'm not going to get to um, show it, because it would take a really long time. Yeah. Uh, let's, this is my favorite artist, by the way, Paul Papera. Yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, Beautiful work. Yeah. I know. Just so sad. Yep. But um, let's see. What's a good example here? Um, I guess this is probably a good example, this uh, peeling paint material. Mm. So basically, there's these tiny little imperfections. So you have stretching on the peeling uh, of this paint. Okay. You have the curling of the paint where it's peeling. You have color distortion, um, basically different shades of blue, different shades of white. And uh, the metal's different colors, and the scratches don't follow a uniform pattern. They're all kind of uh, intricate in their own way. Mm -hmm. um, so it helps it look not procedural, and it also drives realism. So basically, the more stuff that you can layer onto something, as long as you're not overdoing it, I think it adds to a more realistic material.
About how many nodes I mean, would you say this, mm-hmm. this something like this might have? Well, I can open it up. Oh, awesome. Let's see. Yeah, let's see. Uh, okay, I have it here. Yeah, these substance painter smart materials, mm-hmm. they're super heavy um, as far as how many nodes there are, but it will basically texture almost an entire model if you just throw it onto anything. Um, it's kind of like a one-stop shop texture kind of deal. So it's it, all in all, it it's not heavy for what it is. But um, well, we're looking at your art station right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm just okay. browsing uh, one of my file folders. Okay, got it. Yeah, good. For it. Very yeah. wise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I always pull those off screen. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if that's it. I just have way too many materials I'm working on right now. You know what? I'll just have it download in the background from uh, my Gumroad page while we wait. Oh, okay. It's uh, actually really interesting. You can kind of use Gumroad as Dropbox, mm-hmm. and it's free. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> a quick tip there. Yeah. Um, so if, and you don't even have to post a material to be able to download it again. And, you know, with Dropbox being like, what is it now, like $10 a month, it gets to add up with all your other subscriptions that are out there nowadays. Yeah. So, uh, Yes. So I think l- let's take a look at the nodes, and mm-hmm. we've seen some of the power of this. And, yeah. then, um, mm-hmm. and then I think we might want to just drop in and, and start to understand some of the connection of designer to substance painter. Because mm-hmm. I know in substance painter, you can go and you can get materials, basically, from the uh, asset store. Correct, yeah. Yeah, so with Substance Painter, yeah, let's see. We can jump in right now. Okay, yeah, why don't um, we do that now? So then if you're in yeah. Substance Painter, mm-hmm. like how does this material translate into something that mm-hmm. you work in in Substance Painter? Yeah, so basically to create a smart material, once you have these layers set up, which are just blends of different materials inside of Substance mm-hmm. Painter. So like I usually like to start off with just a base. So from any of these provided smart materials that they give. You just drag and drop them, and uh, you just start kind of layering them on top of each other with masks. And then what you do, once you have it done, just create smart material, and a smart material will automatically be added to your library. So it's right here. Mm -hmm. And then what I would do if I want to texture an asset is, uh, second, just going to open up an example scene. So uh, say that this was my mesh that I had. What I would do is just uh, take my wood material, the smart material I just created, Mm -hmm. and drag and drop it. So you can basically, all you do is drag and drop, and it automatically applies all the procedural effects that you had inside of the smart material. So essentially, if I were like texturing a wood table, all I would do is drag my smart material over from in the Substance Painter library. Mm -hmm. And uh, then probably just blend it with um, a few other materials. So, for example, if I had a uh, paint material, and this is going to be a bad material since I don't really have like a default paint material. But let's see if I have that effect. And smart masks. You're pulling smart from masks. another screen, mm-hmm. right? Oh, yeah. Sorry about yeah, that. No worries. No, I keep on. Yeah. <laughs> just so everybody Let's knows see, it's yeah. not magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my secret. It's all magic. <laughs> yeah. So basically, there's these really cool uh, smart materials inside Substance Painter. Or not smart materials, smart masks. Oh, um, I, I don't know, know why. Those are of beauty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know why more people don't use them. They're really kind of like the bread and butter of Substance to me. So oh, yeah. um, it's, we use them. drag and drop. We use them mm-hmm. in the boot camp all the time. Everybody's using those. Yeah. Ones. That's perfect. Yeah, because I know like a lot of places, they won't develop some of these newer techniques. So they're kind of stuck using like generators or something. I know a lot of schools that were doing that, but that's super cool that you guys are doing that already. But yeah, so like say that this was like a proper paint material, just drag and drop it and edit within a smart mask. And you can start growing like paint onto this wood here. And it's just super, super powerful, especially if you have to make changes to like a certain object Mm -hmm. as far as materials go. Really, really good for art direction. So I definitely recommend using smart masks. Nowadays, I don't really do that much hand painting of materials even. 
right. um, just because it's so powerful. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much. Uh, so let, smart let math. me see if I if I mm-hmm. understand. So basically, you can create materials mm-hmm. inside a substance painter, but a lot of it Correct, is yeah. using mm-hmm. materials that already exist, and then mm-hmm. and then you're you're yep. reliant upon the um, smart masks to really layer things. Correct. Uh, yeah, but mm-hmm. you know, if you go into substance designer, then you can mm-hmm. go in there and create a more robust material. Correct. Exactly. Uh, yeah. One hundred percent. Yep. With hundreds of nodes, I would assume, to really yep. make sure that, like, it would probably be way mm-hmm. too confusing to have hundreds of layers mm-hmm. in substance. Yeah, painting. that's um. Yeah. For example, let's see. Oh, I have it here. Actually, I don't know why I was trying to download it from my Gumroad. But um, this is that metal material I was talking about, which mm-hmm. is pretty interesting. This was made 100% in substance painter just for kind of a proof of concept. I'm not sure I'd recommend using just 100% substance painter. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Actually, this one isn't bad at all. But basically, you're mixing a matte effects material along with a metal material with a paint material along with another paint material, a rust and a dirt. So this is like pretty expensive at runtime since you have like one, two, three, four, five, six different materials, all with separate layers for masking and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and did a you, worse, say you did mm-hmm. this in Substance Painter or Substance Designer? This was Substance Painter oh. only. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I've been using Substance Painter a lot lately just for materials mm-hmm. um, because it's just really, really fast. And for creating metal materials, it's perfect. Yeah. But anything other than metal, I do not create in Substance Painter. Okay. Just because metals are kind of perfect for Substance Painter. They're nice and simple, and they don't require too much editing. So, What about skin um, and things like that? I actually haven't tried doing skin yet. All right. You have um, to let us know when you yes. do, because that's like the holy grail. of uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, character. I know, but, yeah. Yeah, I've been really wanting to try it. Yeah, one of my uh, buddies at work, I'm not sure if you know him, he was like a uh, older ZBrush user, Tayon Alexander. Um, yeah, I know Tayon. I, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. He's taking classes. Oh, awesome. Tayon's great. Oh, really? That, mm-hmm. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, yeah. He was um, yeah, he was talking about you. Yeah. yeah um, nice guy. I, really he was nice. talking about skin shaders. And like, I, <laughs> I wish I could create them right now, but like Algorithmic has a pretty good skin shader for the most part. Um, just kind of this right here, mm-hmm. which eventually I'll probably try to do some skin, but for now, um, I'm just kind of sticking to my uh, metals and some more sci-fi studies lately. Cool. But yeah, no, I'm totally going to try it though. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it'll be fun. All right, yeah. well, let's open this up for <laughs> questions, man. I really appreciate sure. you kind of walking us through that example inside a designer and then mm-hmm. coming in and taking a look at Painter. So I, yeah, I've got totally. a few yeah. questions. I'm going to jump, sure. but guys, start typing now with your questions. I'm going to go back in time and see what you guys had posted. I have a limited capacity to go back in comments, though. So please post cool. them right now. Isaac, Isaac Rivera, he's in the Environment Artist mm-hmm. Bootcamp. Uh, which mm-hmm. substance designer artist tutorials do you recommend mm-hmm. to learn how to use substance mm-hmm. designer? Um, Let's see. It's kind of strange. Substance Designer, I didn't really follow many tutorials, Mm -hmm. but the ones that really got me started that were really good were, um, it's uh, Hugo Bayer. Um, Just, they're free on YouTube. Uh, Let's see. They're great tutorials, too. I totally recommend it. So, let's see. Yeah, so, um, let's see. Can I copy and paste a link into the chat? Yeah, in GoToMeeting, you can. Oh, sweet. Uh, Let's see. I'll just paste it here, just so it's easy. This is a really, really great tutorial to get started. There's also the Noman Workshop. They have a lot of really good tutorials for getting started. Um, they have some free ones on their YouTube channel, which are good too. Yeah. And also, of course, Wes, he makes probably the best substance tutorial out of anyone. Yeah, and this um, is a Wes McDermott, for those of you who don't yeah, know. Yep. 3D yeah, yep. 3D Ninja. Wes, yep, yeah, yeah, he is a 3D Ninja. That's, it's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... Um, That would probably be uh, the learning resources. I've heard some really, really great things about Josh Lynch's tutorials. I didn't get one myself, but one of my buddies was learning from one of his tutorials, and it was uh, really good. Yeah, actually, these guys had Josh Lynch in, not Harker. I think I said Harker last time because I was thinking of a sculptor. But Josh, we had had Josh Lynch in and uh, did a really awesome walkthrough. Oh, that's killer. 
Yeah. Uh, but I think I, I kind of want to follow up on something because one mm-hmm. of the things that I think is really important is, um, mm-hmm. and, spe- and Isaac, I, I know that you're like, you're very thorough about these things, but get in there and just start to play with some of those buttons. Cause it sounds mm-hmm. like that's one of the tricks to this is just, there's so much, so many things mm-hmm. you can do that it sounds like James, that's what you did. You just mm-hmm. jumped in and started doing stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. The most important thing is just messing around, really. I still just mess around. Like, 90% of the time when I'm creating something in a substance, I have, like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of, like, throwing stuff around, seeing how it's working together. Um, And I think it's somewhat of an important design choice within substance. Um, Because once you start doing those random iterations... Mm -hmm. Um, once you learn to replicate those like seemingly random like textures or whatever that's when you really start learning and it starts coming really fast yeah i know um for like substance designer it all clicked within it was like this one week it just suddenly clicked which (laughs) that's something that's really cool about substance designer um yeah Mm -hmm. all right ira I am doing a leather material ira's in the environment Mm -hmm. boot camp too and in fact oh my gosh awesome um Lauren, I'd love to show you what I'd love to show you what these guys are doing, but I think what we'll have to do totally, is get yeah. you in. You know what? Uh, I don't think did we add you into Artist Awake into the network? I don't. I don't know. Okay, why don't, don't we do so. this? I'm going to switch this around, and we're going to start to look at my screen. Sweet. And then, uh, and then I'll drop into Artist Awake, uh, and Sounds then we awesome. can kind of get these questions and have some context. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love looking at uh, other people's work. It's like one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, nice. All right. So uh, let's get in and we will take a look at first since Isaac was up. Let's take a look at that. Mm-hmm. Isaac's. Yeah. Wow, that's super killer. Yeah, yeah that was. Mm-hmm. And there we go. All right. So Isaac's on, mm-hmm. on the track. He's got a lot of different mm-hmm. materials that he's got to do to pull this together. Mm-hmm. And then. Yeah. Um, Let's mm-hmm. get you in and get Ira's question answered. So, Ira, mm-hmm. I'm just going to pull your work up, Ira, and then, um, and then we can ask that. So, this mm-hmm. is what she was on last. Are you? Wow, to see that's that? sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That looks awesome. Okay, so yeah, she's, yeah. she's mm-hmm. saying I'm doing a leather material, but the procedural map and substance mm-hmm. is too uniform. And she's referring to yeah. this mm-hmm. part right here. Yep. Yep. Um, um, and then hold on, let me see if there was another part to the question. Yes. Mm-hmm, sure. Uh, would it be possible to just show me how to do a mask of the leather pattern mm-hmm. in Substance Designer? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. I guess leather is a super tough material to replicate. Uh, shall see. I uh, switch back to mm-hmm. you so you're sharing your screen? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Uh, let me make you presenter. Oh. Okay. So um, I'm not sure how well this is going to turn out this is just a quick bust but Mm -hmm. um let's see i think oh how will i start this one yeah leather is one of those materials that there's like a really easy way to do it and then there's a right way to do it um, just to get like the right result (laughs) i love that there's an easy way to screw this up (laughs) yeah oh yeah you can screw up leather so easily like i remember i was trying for like two weeks to create a leather material um, at work. And I just, I, I ended up just mashing a ton of materials together and it just looked really haphazard. Yeah. Yeah. And that, but, in ZBrush, I know you could sculpt the pattern and it's not, it's not, you know, terribly hard to sculpt that pattern. The skin brush is actually really useful for doing that, but getting yeah, that yeah, procedural, I, that's the trouble. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really tough. Um, Let's see if I can do a. Uh, so let's see. I will break this down in a second. Yeah, what I'm doing worry. because I don't want to start saying something and it being like the absolute wrong way to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, and while you're doing this, I'll talk to Ira because mm-hmm. I, I wrote oh. and I were talking about how last time um, she's got to find some material where they're layering on different scale of these procedural shapes. And so actually, Ira, if you. Uh, that you can see James actually doing that right now. So he's kind of getting a whole bunch of different patterns of different sizes. And now he's got to go in and he's got to find a way to kind of blend between them to kind of keep some elements, hide some others. And, uh, 
Oh, there's a really cool uh, node. This is new in Substance Designer. This came cool. out like a couple weeks ago mm. if you're on the latest version, but it's the uh, vector warp okay. grayscale. I don't know if it'll work for this, but um, I always like messing oh. around with it since it's a new tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's super trippy, but um, we oh, can uh, basically wait. adjust it just to get rid of some of that uniform. Yes, perfect. Yeah, yeah. and uh, let's see if we go to uh, rules. kind of get like i know leather has like kind of like a flat kind of top to it a lot of times so mm -hmm. i'm just trying to uh get that kind of thing going here notice how so he's working with the uh, black and white at this point too mm -hmm. guys he's really not focused on color just keeping the variables mm -hmm. that he needs to consider at a mm -hmm. minimum yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I would recommend not working with color when you're making your material. That's usually my last part because it's really, really distracting. And it's it's almost like when you're modeling in like Maya, if you're trying to do some hard surface model and you're using like a super shiny material to start out with, mm -hmm. it might end up screwing up your overall product because you might have some really bad normal issues going on that maybe were more prevalent than they needed to be or they were not prevalent enough. So, yeah, I usually leave colors for last, for sure. So just another levels. I'm just going to see how this is looking right now in 3D. That's another thing. I also like to go into 3D only after I think I've made a pretty good uh, base. Because yeah. otherwise you can uh, end up messing up your material, too. But um, just do a uh, let's see. blur. Oh, and when you uh, when you use a blur node, you probably want to use a uh, blur high quality grayscale. Okay. Uh, simply because it doesn't give you as many artifacts as um the regular blur node does. And if you are getting some artifacts, just try changing your document to be 16 bit. I see a lot of people making that mistake, like on ArtStation and stuff. But um, let's see what went what went wrong here. Okay, that's what went wrong. Cool. And if um, um nobody else saw what went mm -hmm. wrong, don't worry, I'm with you. Yep, I'll I'll explain it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh basically what went wrong was uh in this normal map, I really really did not want this like harsh edge which I probably could have blurred out, but I just want to play it safe now yep. that we're at the beginning of the production for this. Yep. Because if I keep these changes and it's later on down the road, it'll be a little bit more hectic. Where did this go? There you are. And why is this so... And get rid of that. <clears throat> Okay, that should work. And this goes into... And uh, I'll pull on the 3D view in just a second. I just want to leave this up for you guys so that you see what I'm doing. See, so plugging normal into normal. And uh, let's see, HBAO. This is... Uh, HBAO is the ambient occlusion for this. Um, I usually like to put in ambient occlusion pretty early on just so that I know what my light is looking like because... Um, I've had it happen before where I'm just creating a material and basically is screwed up because I overestimated how much normal intensity I needed. This roughness. I'm just going to keep the roughness level at a mid-gray because roughness is something that I add in much later too. See, base color also a mid-gray. Okay, so basically right now it's looking a little procedural because we have these edges going on in here, mm -hmm. which is a might be an easy fix. Okay, we got that and go back here.
Okay. Might start looking a little bit better. And I think one of the things that made a huge difference mm -hmm. right off the bat was that vector. Just yeah, the vector warp. Yeah, it's super, super powerful. Yeah, I would. It totally gave us recommend. the the small clustering and the bigger. Circles. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Let's see. This cannot seem to uh, go away from these large shapes. This is probably another material that might be a little better suited for ZBrush, but um, I know Hugo Bayer, the guy that I linked the tutorial to, mm -hmm. he has an amazing leather texture also. Awesome. Um, he did a lot better job than I did. But um, I guess from like here, if I were to just mess around with levels a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And... Um, And uh, levels is really important, by the way, too. I use it all the time. So that's, I guess that's a little bit more of a hard leather. Was that a uh, synthetic leather on the camera? Or to you tell. To what do you think, Ira? Do you think that was synthetic or, or not? Would did you pick up anything in your research? I'm not sure I know the vocabulary. What's the word? Mm -hmm. synthetic. Uh, synthetic yeah i'm not sure i understand that uh, word. yeah yeah like a uh, plastic yeah oh. sort of like a plastic and when it's like um uh, peel off it has a uh, like a hard edge oh okay uh let's see yeah so for synthetic leather you'd probably want to make like for example the um normal value a little bit more sharp just since it is and a little bit more flat since mm -hmm. it, it won't have the properties that standard leather would um let's see what's going on here well this is really cool to see this so i, I think um sometimes this uh broadcasting dies after an hour or so mm -hmm. oh okay why don't we take a, a quick breakdown on this and see if there's any more sure. questions mm -hmm. but just give us a, a if you don't mind you started out with a whole bunch of what? What were those no mm -hmm. nodes, the cellular yeah. nodes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So let's see, the cells, this is uh, cells one. Okay. So. Um, I probably could have used any of the cell nodes. I just liked this one because it had these uh, kind of more round shapes in it. Okay. You could have used cells three here. It's really, really hard to see what's going on here because it's like super micro detail. Oh, yeah. Um, this actually, you know what? This probably would have been a better one to use because if you just throw it into a bevel, I think it would actually create a much better material. Let's see, I'm just going to do this real quick just to see Absolutely. if I screwed up. Levels. Very interesting. Ah. 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 Okay. Okay. I was at. Yeah, it looks like that was your computer. Uh-oh. Yeah, I can see a little glimmer of hope in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it almost looks like it'll work. This is another thing, like I was saying earlier, where um, it's really just down to experimentation. Mm -hmm. Let's see. My computer is, like, flipping out right now. That's so strange. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, actually, maybe we were good with what we were just using, but um. Well, this is just this, a good is, variation. Mm -hmm. So you've got yeah. cells mm -hmm. one, cells two, three, but you just chose a bunch of cells, cell ones, right? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. and then you started layering those on top of each other and and adding levels and blurs and, and things of mm -hmm. that nature. 
Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about blurs are super, super useful. And then of course, blends. They're like, those are probably the two core features of the program. Mm. Um, just like blends and blurs really. That's strange. There's a real pleather, okay, like this is a real plasticky leather to that. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah. And then we went to oh, concrete. Oh, that's why. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, because the bevel node I disconnected, yeah. But, um, <laughs> let's see, anyways. This. All those sliders have to go back. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, yeah, it's so, it's so, so uh, tedious. Um. <laughs> But let's see. I guess I'll just kind of let it be for now. Yeah. I'm um, just explain the important things, which are the noises. So we have that cells node. Of course, all these cells would work if you just use like an edge detector, something. Mm -hmm. I want to say this is the one that Hugo Bayer actually used. Yeah. Yeah. This looks good. Yeah. I like that mm -hmm. for the small yeah, that, pockets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that I'm, I'm like ninety percent sure that that's the right one to use. Yeah. Again, coming back to that 1,000 ways to do things, but it's only like five right ways to do oh, it. There we go. Yeah, I can see it actually with the yeah, I can see a little small densities, the, the variation yeah. in density. So that's nice. Yeah, there we exactly. Go. Yeah, there, there we go. go. Yeah. This that bevel cool is bit. new to me. What does bevel do? Mm -hmm. That's oh, what? yeah. So oh. it um, I usually like to think of it just as a more precise blur. Okay. Um, because have control over the amount of if you think of it like beveling in a 3d program like maya yeah it's doing essentially the same thing but just to a grayscale image um oh, i got it it's not just doing a gaussian mm -hmm. blur per se but, exactly but yeah. it's actually taking into mm -hmm. account what kind of 3d displacement might result mm -hmm. exactly yeah Beautiful. yeah so i yeah i love using bevel all the time yeah, this is, again, another really commonly used nodes, or one of my commonly used nodes, and uh, slope blur. I'm not sure if you've seen this one, but um, basically, if you can blend an image by itself, mm -hmm. you can get, let me turn the samples up, you can get some really, really cool uh, stuff going on here. Let's see. There we go. Oops. I just had it. And this, again, is like something that you can only really figure out after using this program for a while. Um, just as far as like these knowing where on the sliders to position stuff and how much like blur to apply. Let's see. OK, cool. Yeah, so all I did there was uh, add a little blur to this image here. Mm -hmm. And since it's so sharp, oh, because it's already in a blur space scale. Or grayscale. Anyways, this is a good example. If you have a texture that's really sharp, yep, and you want to use it in like a slope blur grayscale, you kind of have to put it through a another blur. Oh. And then once you put it in slope blur, uh, blur grayscale, you can get this really really neat effect okay. going on here. So you can basically get like a cool kind of in between between beveling and blurring. Okay, basically does a blur on each little piece here which we feed that in here. We can get a pretty similar looking leather, actually. So, something like that. All right, yeah. Ira, does that so, help? Um, yes. Can cool. you hear me? Cool. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, sorry, uh, I couldn't... Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, I couldn't... Uh, the right way to do it. But, um, right way to do it. but um, definitely, you go bear. You go bear. Let me look him up real quick. Oh, let's see. I just muted you for a second, Ira, because the sound came back in. So just unmute mute and unmute yourself. Me? No, uh, Ira, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. cool. <laughs> sorry. I was like, <laughs> I was what, like what's James Oh, I didn't for? know I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, and it's always super important to keep learning when you're in substance designer or else you'll forget things like this. <laughs> Let's see. Here we go. Yeah, so this is, yeah, if you're looking to build a leather material, definitely build it off this tutorial here. Hugo, ba Hugo Bayer is just like super, super knowledgeable and his materials look amazing. 
So yeah, I'd really recommend that. Okay, but, um, cool. Did you load? Did you show that mm-hmm. material? Because or that tutorial? Because we were only mm-hmm. seeing your Substance screen. Oh, huh. Let's see. Oh, I put a link to it in the chat. Let me oh, see got it. Never mind. That's here. great. The Vimeo link. Yeah, yeah. This is it right here. So oh, um, basically, yes. yeah, you can see that it looks really, really nice. Mm, that's, um, that's yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, he's um he's amazing at what he does. He's like uh yeah, he's a lot like Josh Lynch, but he's been doing some stuff with Houdini lately, which is uh really really neat. But um yeah, Josh yeah. is actually bringing up Houdini. And oh, that's uh, sweet. I didn't yeah. know that he used it. He's he was mentioning that he that was one of the things he was ex- uh, looking forward to kind of get in and explore. Um, because yeah, we were, we yeah. were trying to understand, mm-hmm. you know, like how environment artists work because you're you're mm-hmm. a hard surface artist, right? Yeah, yeah. I spend most of my time in uh, Substance Painter, which I haven't used Substance Designer for about like a month and a half, I wouldn't say. Mm. So I'm a little bit rusty, but um, Substance Painter is like my main package for hard surface. For environment art, it would totally be Substance Designer. All right. Um, okay. Yes. Well, I think mm-hmm. we're hitting time here, so we'll get you back. And uh, man, thank you so much. I, we have to have you yeah, in totally, again. Man. Yeah, I could talk to you like all day. You, you're, oh, yeah, I'd love to. Your Definitely. knowledge on this is just fantastic. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, all right, guys, so make sure you check out James. And really, I, I want you guys, everybody here, to look at his art station and really get themselves familiar you know, with the way in which he's presenting himself. Because I think, uh, James, mm-hmm. you're a real model for us as artists and how we kind of present ourselves and get that job. Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah. yeah, I guess just on like a uh, final note, I guess, mm-hmm. um, if you have any questions or anything, I usually try to get back to everyone that messages me on like ArtStation or through email, doesn't really matter. So if you have any questions about anything, feel free to reach out. Um, and I, I think and, you, have, uh, a, you yeah. have a personal message. Mm-hmm. I think you've done something with your Gumroad this month, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, basically, um, I had a, a thing up on ArtStation, but um, I, it was becoming a little bit too, um, I guess, controversial. Uh, heated yeah a little bit too controversial a little yeah. bit too political yeah but it was just for net neutrality all sales on uh, gumroad are going towards just keeping an open and free internet yeah that's great it's great uh, it's mm-hmm. important that we have things outside of this industry that we care about you know and that we mm-hmm. that really provides some foundation for us mm-hmm. you know so i uh, mm-hmm. i appreciate that that's really great yeah yeah i mean i know for like uh for the texture site like mine i mean it's not really it wasn't started like the goal of really making uh, money from it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was more of about kind of changing the way that the texture industry works. Um, I just hated subscriptions. I didn't like them. Um, and uh, also I just kind of wanted some more high quality materials out there. So kind of started for me, kind of wanted to change things. And uh, I think I reached it um, at that point. Um, so now I'm just kind of trying to focus on some uh, other issues, um, which is, why just a hundred percent of the proceeds are going towards uh, that goal? So, um, yeah, I mean, if yeah, if you support net neutrality or anything, feel free to stop by the shop. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, James. Thank you again so much, and thanks guys for coming in here. And remember, um, this is just part of what we're doing for you at the guild. It's just weekly uh, training to kind of keep you guys you know, up to date and make sure that you are availing yourself of people as awesome as, uh, as James. I'm sitting here trying to do two things at the same time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, well, so that's yeah. Daily life of an artist, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, guys, leave me a comment. Um, tell us, tell us in the live, uh, in the guild below the video, if you haven't already, you can hear it's trash day out over here. Oh, oh, yeah, same for me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, leave a note. What did you learn from this? What are you picking up? And uh, what did you find really valuable? You know, just leave me one or two things, and then I'll make sure I share that with James so he can see, you know, what, what you guys really got out of this conversation with mm-hmm. him. So give him something back, and uh, have a fantastic weekend. And James, man, have a great weekend, and thank you so much for, for sharing and, and spending so much time with us. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Ryan. I really had a great time. So. All right, awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll do this again. Sounds awesome. Yeah, totally. (laughs) All right. Take care. All right. Later.
All right. So I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking the time and for listening to this podcast. And I want to ask a couple of things from you. Number one, make sure you leave a comment or you rate this on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're getting this. That's going to make a big difference in helping us get the word out and get people to know who we are. All right. The other thing is I want to make sure you know where to find us. So you can head over to www.gameartinstitute.com where you can learn about our flagship program, which is the Game Artist Boot Camp. This, this is designed for those who are really looking to move the needle on their career and really lock in that job. You may have gone to school and learned a bunch, maybe haven't learned a bunch, But at the Game Art Institute, the primary focus we have is the very specific industry skills, the triggers that you really need to hit in that job interview. What are the specific things that they're looking for? That's what we're going to be training you on. We're taking applications right now for environment artists and for character artists. So make sure you head over to www.gameartinstitute.com and apply today. That way we can have that conversation, make sure this is a fit for you, make sure that you're a fit for it. And if everything is perfect, then we will sign you up for that right away and get you into your training and start moving the needle on your career. All right. Thank you so much again for being here. Take care. Have an amazing day.